Nestled into a faraway corner of Eastern Europe, in a quiet, sleepy part of the world where borscht flows like wine and, well, vodka flows like vodka, you're going to find the small landlocked country of Moldova. Nestled into the crook of Ukraine's arm to the north, south, and east, and resting happily beside Romania to the west, Moldova is the sort of place that most people wouldn't think about once in the span of a year. It's not a major or even a minor geopolitical player. It's got hardly two and a half million people to its name, and its history as a former SSR of the Soviet Union could be cobbled together relatively easily using the excerpts of the histories of the nations around it. But Moldova's got a secret, a small, well-hidden pocket of the country that claims that it isn't Moldova at all. Known as Transnistria, sprawled across a strip of narrow land running up and down the majority of Moldova's eastern edge, this breakaway region claims that it's a country all its own, despite not being recognized by a single nation on Earth. And somehow, in Transnistria's case, its breakaway status manages to be one of the least weird things about it. From a massive corporate monolith that seems to rule the whole country to a culture that still idolizes Soviet culture decades after the rest of the region left it behind to its geopolitical relevance as both a smuggler's haven and as a Russian proxy, Transnistria might well be the strangest place on Earth. And it's Transnistria that we're going to be visiting today. All right, now before we dive into all of the absolute weirdness that is Transnistria, let us start with the basics and try and figure out just what sort of place we're dealing with here. Transnistria boasts a population of some 465,000 people that are spread across an area of just over 4,000 square kilometers. That's under three times the land area of Greater London. But it's built in a valley some 200 kilometers long with a width of just a few kilometers in some areas. It's actually one of the more interesting geographical anomalies of the world. This region stretches across the bank of the Dniester River, separating it from Moldova, and Transnistria's own name even reflects that fact. Transnistria is an anglicization of Transdniester, meaning beyond the Dniester River. This simple geographic separation is one of the few reasons why Transnistria considers itself an entity apart from Moldova, but we'll get into the specifics of how that works in a little bit. The Transnistrian capital city, a small regional hub called Tiraspol, makes up a little less than a third of the country's population. The breakaway region is administered as a unitary republic under President Vadim Krasnoselsky and a supreme council made up of 33 members, most of whom share very close ties with international interests in Russia. Economically, Transnistria gets by mostly on its production of steel and textiles as well as electricity. And although there's a lot more about its economy that we're absolutely going to get into shortly, Suffice to say for now that the region's total GDP, a hair over 1.2 billion US dollars, does not go very far when it's divided among nearly half a million people. Transnistria trades in its own Transnistrian ruble, a currency that can't be used or exchanged anywhere else on Earth except in a few bus stations and shops in nearby parts of Moldova, and predictably the currency has devalued quite a bit with time. In keeping with its status as a sort of waypoint within the former Soviet bloc, the region's pretty diverse, with about a quarter of the population being ethnic Russians, about a third being Ukrainians, about a third being Moldovans and Romanians. Linguistically, too, the area is a bit of an Eastern European melting pot, although Eastern Orthodox Christianity exerts a controlling influence among Transnistria's religious sects. Internationally, Transnistria is recognized by only three other meaningful entities, all of whom are their own breakaway states, Abkhazia and South Ossetia in the country of Georgia, and Artsakh in the territory of Azerbaijan. But when it comes to the internationally recognized countries in the area, particularly Ukraine, Moldova, and Russia, they most certainly know that Transnistria exists, even if they don't entertain Transnistrian claims to independence. Now, even from this small snapshot of Transnistria, a few things should immediately become clear. On the grand scheme, we're dealing with a region that, even if it were a country, would hardly command much attention on its own. In terms of population, it's roughly as populous as Belize, the Bahamas, or Iceland, countries that typically are only brought up internationally as vacation destinations. And with no stunning beaches or volcanic tundra to explore, Transnistria doesn't even have that going for it. 
What it does have are a number of characteristics that turn it into a very insular place, both intentionally and unintentionally. Just the fact that it's separated from the rest of Moldova by a river nestled into its own valley isn't a half-bad starting point, but add in the use of its own currency, add in an ethnic makeup that looks nothing like the rest of Moldova, and add a ruling government that claims it isn't a part of Moldova at all, and what you get is a place where a whole lot of rules and norms about the way the world works are going to just fall away. In a hermetically sealed environment like that, things are going to get weird. And they start with an organization known as the Sheriff. So, on Tuesday, the 28th of September 2021, the Spanish football club Real Madrid marched onto the Champions League pitch for a match that they could win with their eyes closed and both hands tied behind their back. Their opponents that day were a team called Sheriff Tiraspol, hailing from and bearing the name of Transnistria's capital city. And to hear the entire world tell it, Sheriff Tiraspol were going to collapse in tears the second any player from Real Madrid so much as breathed in their direction. Founded in 1997, representing a tiny stretch of land that nobody had ever heard of, Sheriff Tiraspol's players looked for all the world like a granny who'd found her way into a black metal concert instead of the knitting circle next door. Metadata company Gracenote gave Sheriff Tiraspol a 1.4 chance of winning the game before it began, with their team being ranked 175th in the league, guaranteed to take a loss to third-ranked Madrid and be patted on their heads for trying their best. Except Sheriff Tiraspol didn't lose that day and they didn't even draw. In one of the most unlikely sporting upsets in history, this little team from Transnistria beat Real Madrid two goals to one and completely shut the Spaniards out from scoring in open play. It was the sort of performance that required either Real Madrid's team to have all suffered a head trauma the day before, or required Sheriff Tiraspol to be guided by the hand of God. But then, that latter opinion might not have been so unlikely after all, because the football team Sheriff Tiraspol, like just about anything else in Transnistria, belongs to the Sheriff Company. And in everyday Transnistrian life, Sheriff is about as close to a deity as anyone could get. Second only to the economic power of Transnistria's state-owned Moldova Steelworks, Sheriff exerts extreme economic pressure over this small breakaway region, even though other than their football team's occasional upset wins, they're all but unheard of in the rest of the world. Sheriff rules Transnistria with all the monopolistic authority of an industrial age company town, with sheriff-branded gas stations, supermarkets, television, mobile phone networks, literary publishing, alcohol-baked good advertising, and construction, not to mention football, all under the company's direct control. All told, Sheriff commands a hold on some 60% of the entire Transnistrian economy, with total monopolies on several elements of the regional economy, specifically trade, oil, and media. And when we say Sheriff rules Transnistria, we're really not kidding. Co-created by Moldovan Russian billionaire Viktor Gushen, who was known as the Sheriff during his time serving as a member of the KGB, and no, we're not making up a supervillain origin story here. Sheriff was exempted from customs duties early in Transnistria's political history, and they exert such a strong control over Transnistria's only political party that they are functionally a political arm to ensure that Sheriff stays in business. So deep are Sheriff's ties all up and down Transnistria that the region's former president, a man named Yevgeny Shevchak, had to flee Transnistria after his term ended because Gushin and the Sheriff were allegedly trying to assassinate him as retaliation for Shevchak having called Sheriff's state corruption out during his time in office. Now, depending on who you ask, Gushin is often considered the de facto leader of Transnistria, pulling strings in the dominant political party, Obnovlenim, which has swelled in support since the year 2000. The leaders of the party are generally quite amenable to Sheriff and vice versa, and the state directly pays out its own budget to Sheriff and its subsidiary companies. Controls over the products imported to Transnistria overwhelmingly favor Sheriff's business interests, ensuring that, say, Sheriff brand vodka doesn't have to compete with Cousin Igor's very, very good vodka drink, or that anybody requesting a permit to open a non-Sheriff petrol station has their application. Let's just say lost in the mail, shall we? Today, Sheriff's five-pointed stop is all but ubiquitous in Transnistria, unavoidable when walking down a major street in Tiraspol or the region's other small cities, and watching from across the Danaista Moldova is basically unable to intervene. 
The nation has attempted to bring non-sheriff Transnistrian businesses into a greater partnership with the rest of the Moldovan state and tried to get them access to the markets of the European Union, a move that has certainly had some effect. But in many ways, this is uh, but a small erosion away from the immense power that Sheriff holds. And look, it's important to note that Sheriff's rise is widely understood to have been a brutal, brutal piece of business. Far more than simply buying up factories and undercutting competitors, Sheriff is believed to have played a very active role in the real violence of Transnistria's early years of independence, with the companies and forces killing and being killed by a long list of rival business leaders who attempted to stand in their way. As Transnistria's former foreign minister, Valerie Litske, put it in an interview with Agence France Presse, if you go to our cemeteries, you will see whole alleys of bandits. As Litske explains it, the bandits who survived those early wars and fought on the side of Sheriff are now better known as police officers, wearing a thin veil of legitimacy in order to propagate their business empire further. But just as insidious as Sheriff's dystopic hold over the Transnistrian economy are its instruments of social control. Now, in order to have this conversation at all, we do have to work inside the base assumption that, by and large, the actions of the Transnistrian government are tightly interrelated to the goals and the objectives of the Sheriff Corporation. But when we take the two together, Transnistria's disturbing patterns of human rights abuses are cast in a whole other light. And as for what those human rights abuses are, we'll just pull a few highlights from a 2020 report by the US State Department, shall we? Forced disappearances by the authorities, confirmed cases of torture and degradation by the authorities, dangerous prison conditions where prisoners risk death while incarcerated, arbitrary detention, judicial corruption, severe restrictions on free expression and the press, active repression against journalists, online privacy violations and severe content restrictions, a nearly complete set of restrictions on free movement, a lack of will to investigate violence against women or LGBT persons, I've run out of fingers, laws against same-sex sexual contact between consenting adults, and as a cherry on top, let's just throw in child labor, shall we? And when an ordinary Transnistrian runs afoul of Sheriff or is compelled to work in dangerous conditions on Sheriff's behalf, the company is highly unlikely to face any accountability for what may come next. In one example, a businessman named Vadin Seban was found dead inside his home in Transnistria on the 10th of June 2020, beaten to death with a shovel. See, Seban had openly criticized the Transnistrian government, fought back against Sheriff's economy, and posted an image in a Transnistrian Facebook group with the words, Sheriff, repent. And in a similar case, earlier this year, in July of 2023, a man named Oleg Korjan was murdered in his home in Transnistria for unknown reasons. Korjan, the head of the Transnistrian Communist Party, was Transnistria's last surviving opposition leader prior to his death. Journalists who have attempted to expose abusive or unhealthy work conditions at sheriff's factories have been threatened and fined, and members of Transnistrian militias, often directly loyal to sheriff, operate with impunity across the region. And it does not stop there. Defectors from the Transnistrian armed forces have been disappeared when returning to visit family, and ordinary citizens have been detained and disappeared, often without any reason given. Prisoners who've done time in Transnistria have been reported being drugged, starved, and exposed to prisoners who are actively infected with tuberculosis or having medical access withheld after being beaten by their guards. Victims of domestic violence in Transnistria have basically no recourse unless they receive broken bones or a concussion with anything less seen only as an administrative offense even children have not been spared. In one incident at an orphanage for children with special needs, many such children were beaten and dunked into wash basins against their will as forms of corporal punishment. And as we've always got to note when discussing parts of the world that restrict press access and obscure the truth of the situation, these are just the incidents that we know about. We can all but guarantee that there's more, and quite possibly a lot worse, going on that we'll never know about.
And then we've got to discuss the authority Transnistria exerts over its own media environment. On the one hand, writers who attempt to expose the realities of the situation in Transnistria are typically greeted with outright retaliation. One writer named Larissa Kalik, who attempted to expose violent hazing within the Transnistrian armed forces, was charged with extremism and forced to go into hiding. Another, the Communist Party leader named Alexander Simoni, suffered the same fate after criticizing the regime on social media. Other Transnistrians have received prison sentences for insulting public officials, and journalists in the country have taken to self-censorship simply in order to keep their heads. On the other hand, there's the narratives that Transnistria and the Sheriff Corporation do have control over. Transnistria has two media organizations, the state-run public agency for telecommunication, and, you guessed it, Sheriff Holding. Sheriff also controls Transnistria's largest internet service provider and has been accused of trying to eliminate all other ISPs in the region. Both the government and Sheriff crank out a long line of generally pro-Russia, generally pro-Sheriff, and generally anti-Moldova propaganda pieces in both print and television. Ukrainian, Moldovan, and European media can be accessed, including television channels, but they require extra fees to access, while Transnistrian and Russian media do not. In a country where GDP per capita is the equivalent of under $2,600 US dollars per year, it's not hard to imagine that any free media might quickly become unaffordable. But even despite the incredible depth of Sheriff's hold over Transnistria and the outright dystopian environments that Sheriff and the Transnistrian government have created, the people of Transnistria still maintain a presence in the rest of Moldova. Those who hold a Transnistrian passport can travel to the rest of the country with relative ease. Many Transnistrians hold jobs across Moldova, and many extended families have members on both sides of the regional dividing line. Sheriff Tiraspol competes against the rest of Moldova's football teams, where they've won league titles in 20 of the last 22 seasons by buying a better roster of players than anyone else in Moldova could ever hope to achieve. Sadly for the players of Sheriff Tiraspol, very few people actually show up to watch the games anymore, given that their outcomes are functionally preordained, but, well, that doesn't really matter that much when the football team exists just to launder massive amounts of money, allegedly. Far more important to Sheriff, in any case, is the degree to which Sheriff Tiraspol, Transnistrian currency and passports, and the Sheriff conglomeration's hand in many, many industries afford them the leverage to operate with impunity inside of Transnistria, while the rest of Moldova looks on, stuck with a neighbor that might as well be from another world. Now, in its current state, Transnistria is a place weighed down by mafia-style corporatism, isolated and cut off from the rest of the world. But in many ways, the seeds for its current state were planted long ago by a series of decisions made deep in the heart of the Soviet Union. Transnistria has been distinct from the area now known as Moldova for quite a long time, with the Dniester River forming a natural divide between its West Bank, a Romanian-speaking population, and its East Bank, a Ukrainian-speaking one. Of course, this is something of an oversimplification compared to the real complexities of that time, but we'll hold off on a real lesson in 17th century Bessarabian history today. The first real point of interest here came in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, as migration of Romanian speakers to the far side of the Dniester began to increase, and it laid the groundwork for the much more multi-ethnic Transnistria that we see today. By the time that the Russian Empire more or less evolved into the Soviet Union, the place we now call Transnistria was already somewhat diverse, and it was quite clearly distinct from its western neighbor Moldova, then called Bessarabia. But in 1940, both Bessarabia and Transnistria were lumped into the so-called Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic, with few, if any, steps taken to address the divides between the larger region and the smaller one. This maneuver was not unintentional by the Soviet Union's decision makers, and it wasn't the only case of such a decision being made. The Soviet Union had a long history of consolidating their Soviet Socialist Republics, functionally the equivalent of states or provinces under the Soviet umbrella, in ways that integrated smaller regions that were either disinterested in unifying with the rest of the people inside the Republic or outright opposed to the idea. The ramifications of this choice have played out again and again in recent years between Azerbaijan and its Nagorno-Karabakh region, Georgia, and its South Ossetian and Abkhazian regions, and in the Caucasus regions of Russia, where separatist movements and both violent and nonviolent resistance to a centralized authority have become commonplace. But back in the days of the Soviets, that was largely the point. After all, how could a Soviet socialist republic begin coordinating an uprising against the Union when it couldn't even get its own inhabitants to live together peacefully? 
Starting in the 1920s, the Soviet Union took active steps to create a Moldovan identity that could stand separately from the influence of nearby Romania. Historically speaking, Moldova's roots were largely Romanian, and pre-Moldovan Bessarabia was considered to be a part of Romania outright. But with Bessarabia sequestered under Russian rule, for most of the years that Romania went about establishing itself as a nation-state, the Soviet Union was keen on leveraging those existing divides in order to consolidate modern-day Moldova under the Soviet umbrella. With the help of the Union, a Moldovan language was developed using the same Cyrillic alphabet that Russia does, and a broader spirit of Moldovan identity and even nationalism was very intentionally fostered. As young Moldovan nationalists began to grow up and pursue political careers, the Soviet Union saw to it that they could find their way into real power, starting a sort of snowball effect that saw Moldovan spirit really take hold. But Transnistria, already distinct from the rest of Moldova, experienced an opposite phenomenon. Between an influx of Russian laborers and immigrants enticed to the region by jobs in heavy industry, a great many ethnic Ukrainians who had already made Transnistria their home, and many ethnic Moldovan Romanians with closer ties to Moldova proper, including some who had been getting in on pro-Moldovan movements, the area diversified largely losing its appetite for nationalism of any sort. Moldovan, Ukrainian, Russian, and Romanian each became perfectly acceptable languages in the area. Our rates of intermarriage picked up, and while the region didn't exactly stand opposed to the rest of the Moldovan SSR, it stood, well, maybe just a bit apathetic. And when in the late 1980s, the rest of the Moldovan SSR began exploring the idea of independence from the Soviet Union in favor of a return to closer ties with Romania and the establishment of a sovereign Moldovan state, that news wasn't received well in Transnistria. Fears of so-called Romanianization only picked up as Moldovan nationalists adopted the Romanian Tricolor flag and advocated a reforming Moldova's linguistic landscape to prefer Romanian as a state language. In response, Transnistrians organized into labor collectives and led strikes against Romanianization, emphasizing the damage it might do to the more multicultural communities and families that were by now well established on the other side of the Dnieper. Some of Moldova's strongest Transnistrian opponents were themselves ethnic Moldovan Romanians, who argued that too strong a lean into Romanian language and culture would disadvantage their friends, neighbors, and even members of their own families. In the words of one Transnistrian named Anatoly Tabak, whose family was just one of the thousands like it in the region, I am Moldovan. My wife is Russian. My kids study in Ukraine. I have understood Russian my whole life. I believe that Russian and Moldovan should have the same rights. For someone in that situation, it's hard not to imagine how the positions of the Moldova nationalist movement, especially some hardliners who advocated for the expulsion of Russians and Ukrainians from Moldova entirely, might have been a beast worth fighting. Now, sitting in the mid-2020s, it's easy to look back and see how a Transnistria that chose to keep its ties with Russian language and culture would become an ideal target for the modern Russian regime to exploit, and we'll absolutely be getting to more of that later. But for the Transnistrians of 1989 and 1990, these concerns didn't even register. Their crisis was much more of an existential one, and in the face of Moldovan policies that would have infringed upon what many Transnistrians saw as ethno-linguistic equality, the Transnistrian population decided to look toward their own autonomous future instead of integrating into their neighbor. First, this took the form of political separatism in a series of referendums that established the Pridnestrovian Moldovian Soviet Socialist Republic, or if you'd like something less of a mouthful, as I certainly would, they established Transnistria as its own autonomous entity, loyal to the USSR. And once the Soviet Union itself began to collapse, Tiraspol declared Transnistria to be an independent entity despite a lack of recognition from its neighboring Moldovan capital of Chisinau. The situation escalated further and further, and by March of 1992 it had deteriorated into open war. But this is where things begin to get a bit messy for Transnistria on account of the Russian 14th Army. Although they'd already been stationed in Transnistria for several of the last decades, the 14th Army had largely stood by while the region's referendums took place. But when war broke out, they saw fit to intervene on the side of Transnistria. According to Russia's defense minister at the time, this was not an approved action. Instead, all accounts pointed to those Russian soldiers deciding to take up arms of their own volition in defense of a region where many had established their own homes and families. With the 14th Army's help, Moldova and Transnistria fought to a stalemate by July 1992, and a ceasefire agreement essentially made Transnistria its own autonomous region 
not a recognized sovereign state, but about as close to it as a breakaway region can be without a seat at the UN. Transnistria joins the growing list of so-called frozen conflicts across the former Soviet bloc, a topic that we've actually already done a separate video on if you'd like to learn more. And Moldova settled into a generally tolerant orientation toward Transnistria, largely because of a lack of any other options. But the chaos and uncertainty of the Transnistrian war had soured things significantly in Transnistria by the time a ceasefire was agreed, with the idea of Transnistrian multiculturalism giving way to Russian nationalism. For decades prior to the outbreak of war, Russian language publications of Transnistria had a bit of a nasty habit of vilifying the idea of Romanian influence in the region, telling fabricated stories in which Russian or Ukrainian speakers would lose their Slavic identity and their linguistic heritage upon exposure to Romanian ideals and culture. And when it came time for the Slavic peoples of Transnistria to take up arms against ethnic Romanian Moldovans, that sort of pre-established rhetoric was brought to the forefront. On the one hand, it was used to invigorate ethnic Russians and Ukrainians to fight longer and harder against Moldova, but on the other hand, it substantively changed the way that Transnistria worked. If the enemy, so to speak, was Moldova, then Transnistria shifted into an allegiance towards what they perceived to be a bulwark against Moldovan nationalism. Russian nationalism. In the following years, the Russian language evolved into Transnistria's de facto state language, and though Ukrainian and Moldovan are still recognized as official languages in Transnistria today, neither have been used in quite some time. Most schools in Transnistria now educate their students in Russian, and although Russian influence is balanced out somewhat by the Transnistrian government's effort to fund Moldovan language media, it's not hard to see which language ultimately won. Predictably, this sort of perceived Russification in Transnistria only drove the rest of Moldova further away, and that increased hostility and skepticism from Moldova only proved the point of pro-Russian Transnistrians. Those in Transnistria who opposed the shift toward Russia largely moved westward to Moldova proper, a sort of ideological self-sorting that has only led Transnistria to become even more isolated. And once that isolation really set in, Transnistria began to devolve. Not loudly, or explosively, or with any sort of real civil war, but in a slow, quiet attrition, in which early attempts at a strong state system were worn down by a number of outside interests. With Russia able to support such a friendly breakaway region, even as it arrested right on newly independent Moldova's doorstep, Russian state and non-state influence began to seep further and further into the country's foundation. Corporate interests, like those of the sheriff conglomerate, began to consolidate Transnistrian business holdings, while as economic hardship and resource scarcity began to set in, Russia started to offer more and more in the way of financial and economic support. After all, the money it takes to run Transnistria is roughly the same amount that a single Russian oligarch has in their pockets, and when that small sum is compared against the benefits of having a loyal pro-Russian region in that part of the world, there is no real reason not to spend that little bit of coin. With greater and greater Russian influence has come a greater and greater fondness for Russia within Transnistria. And within just a few years, that fondness had transitioned into political control of Transnistria by politicians and multi-millionaires who've been more than happy to do Russia's bidding. Where that leaves Transnistria now is as something resembling a Russian exclave, where nostalgia for the Soviet Union is not just allowed, but it's actively fostered. Transnistria's flag is the only one left in the entire world featuring communism's traditional hammer and sickle, and it's widely described as existing in some sort of Soviet-era time warp. A statue of Vladimir Lenin glares imposingly outward from the steps of the parliament building in Tiraspol, and images of Russian President Vladimir Putin are commonplace not just in private citizens' homes, but in municipal and federal government offices as well. The city features a Stalinist palace of culture and a Soviet T-34 tank left as a monument to victory in World War II. All this, even though, by any real measure, Transnistria isn't communist at all. Vladimir Lenin, just by example, would probably sooner have vomited at the idea of sheriff's control over the region than endorsed it. This sort of pro-communist imagery in Transnistria isn't exactly a policy position, or at least not in any meaningful way. Instead, it's the functional equivalent of wearing a Che Guevara shirt while enjoying all the perks of downtown Brooklyn. 
All the elements of Soviet-style state control are still present. The restrictions on personal and civil rights, the punitive detention and disappearances, the blatant state propaganda, that sort of thing. But it's a status within Soviet and Russian hegemony, a heritage of worker solidarity and a culture of Transnistrian pride that Transnistria is working to memorialize, not the Leninist vision that led to the rise of the Soviet Union in the first place. So, with Transnistria's rather complex history in mind, one might at least hope that the region could find some semblance of peace under Russia's influence, where, I mean, sure, Sheriff runs everything, and sure, all the politicians are corrupt, but at least things are no different than in, you know, the other former Soviet breakaway regions. But alas, yet again, Transnistria not so lucky. Transnistria doesn't just hold a reputation as a strange corporate kleptocracy. It's not just a communist throwback state. It's known as a hub for organized crime as well. The fall of the Soviet Union and the subsequent mess of shadowy business dealings done in Transnistria have made the region into a haven for smugglers for the better part of three decades. Much of this smuggling is done in and around a small village called Kobasna. Kabasna was home to a massive Soviet weapons depot when the Union collapsed, and surprise, surprise, most of the weapons and ammunition that were once stored there are believed to be gone. And we can't overstate just how massive of a supply this really is. By some estimates, it's the largest weapons depot in all of Europe, with the cumulative power of the tens of thousands of tons of weaponry that are stored there being enough to rival the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Now, obviously, that's a hell of a lot of kit, and with such clear intent by the Transnistrian government, the Sheriff Corporation, and other actors to make Transnistria into a profitable enterprise, it should be no surprise that the region was less interested in effective arms control than in making a buck. Transnistria's borders are known to be exceptionally porous for those who can pay their way through, and for a cut of the profits, just about any government official can be convinced to look the other way or even actively facilitate the passage of smugglers. Across the Ukrainian border, the situation isn't historically much better, and so too could smugglers easily find their way into Moldova and then through to Romania and the edges of Central Europe. In fact, this is even how Sheriff got their start, illegally trading alcohol, cigarettes, and food in order to bypass export controls between the former Soviet states and the rest of the world. Like other subgroups within the Transnistrian smuggling world, Sheriff's early business was largely conducted through the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, which is better known today as a frequent target of Russian attacks on account of the city's major economic significance. Just a stone's throw away from the Moldovan border, Odessa spent decades as a valuable entry and exit point for illegal goods transiting through Eastern Europe, with the port city's own officials historically not against accepting a little bit of cash to ease passage of anything from cigarettes to guns. So popular a smuggling route is Transnistria that in 2011, the American FBI collaborated with Moldovan authorities to prevent the smuggling of a kilogram of uranium-235 for potential use in a nuclear or radiological weapon. Unfortunately for Transnistria's smuggler army, Moldova and Ukraine have worked together to crack down on smuggling in recent years, although calling it a crackdown at all is mostly just relative to the complete lack of oversight that existed before. Now smugglers must travel jointly through administered checkpoints under Moldovan and Ukrainian control, where Ukraine especially has a vested interest in shoring up its own security amidst threats from Russia in the lead-up to the current war. Other inquiries from the European Union, the United Nations, and elsewhere have found reason to indicate that arms smuggling in Transnistria may have slowed significantly or perhaps wasn't such a large problem in the first place. Granted, those claims do lose a bit of their weight when we factor in a system in which a corrupt government, a massive corporation, and arms smugglers are essentially free to collaborate with each other, as well as the Russian military, in order to obscure the flow of illegal goods or hide them underneath seemingly legitimate covers. But look, if you've been watching at home, waiting for just one thing to be optimistic about, well, let this be it. And just before we build that optimism, we've got to absolutely crush it again, specifically when it comes to Transnistria's other smuggling industry, human trafficking. Tragically, Transnistria is a hotbed for sex trafficking, making use of their somewhat centralized location in the Eastern European smuggling sphere to set up paths for victims between Poland, Russia, Ukraine, and Moldova. Children have not been immune either, and are suspected of having been trafficked just the same as adult victims, especially when they can be lured away from neglectful homes and families. 
Transnistria has almost no mechanisms to assist trafficked persons, and the local government has become less and less interested in the issue as time goes on. Now, even though Transnistria still exists largely outside of the view of Western onlookers, it's gained an increasing level of importance in the Eastern European geopolitical sphere in the last few years, owing mostly to Russia's desire to expand its influence in the area. Now, by now, it shouldn't be a surprise that Transnistria is rather a bit of a perfect bedfellow for Vladimir Putin's Russia, an area that is more than happy to accept copious Russian aid, follow Russia's general expectations for its policy at home, and perhaps more importantly, smile and explain to the world just how good a friend Uncle Vlad really is. And it should be even less of a surprise that as Russia has escalated violence into Transnistria's neighbor Ukraine, the small Moldovan breakaway region has seemed more and more like a real asset. Modern-day Moscow considers its alliance with Tiraspol to be a military advantage. But that's certainly not because of Transnistria's own armed forces. With just around 5,000 active duty troops at any given time, armed with dubious training, just 18 tanks and exactly one attack helicopter, Transnistria isn't exactly going to march on Kiev anytime soon. Instead, they host a contingent of 1,500 Russian soldiers who are stationed indefinitely in the region with Transnistria's express approval. These Russian soldiers operate in two contingents. Roughly 500 form a so-called peacekeeping force, patrolling the zones between Transnistria and Moldova and providing oversight to a small demilitarized zone which falls under the control of neither of the opposing governments. The other thousands are there to protect that arms depot that we mentioned before in the village of Kabasna. Situated just a few kilometers from the Ukrainian border, Kabasna alone holds the sort of material and pure firepower that could cause serious problems for Russia, not because anything in that stockpile is particularly advanced, but just because there's so damn much of it. Russia's ongoing presence in Transnistria means that 1,500 of Russia's own soldiers are stationed relatively far afield from Russia's actual territory, where, in an ideal world, they would focus on maintaining Transnistria's autonomy and keeping those weapons in Kabasna secure. According to the rest of the world, though, these troops are used to menace the sovereign nation of Moldova, threaten invasion into parts of Ukraine that haven't yet been attacked directly with ground forces, and possibly even facilitate the smuggling of weapons and ammunition out of Kabasna, either for military or terroristic purposes. And these troops are not shy about posturing either. The larger contingent guard in Kabasna frequently conducts unauthorized training exercises within the demilitarized zone. Like everyone else in Transnistria, these troops are in something of an odd position, barred from traveling in and out of nearby airports in Ukraine or Moldova even for years before Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine, and with the Tiraspol airport supporting exactly one singular flight between 1998 and 2012, these Russians are often stationed in Transnistria for many years at a time, often rotating back and forth between the two units multiple times in order to get home. Short of a full airlift, or either Ukraine or Moldova allowing those troops to cross their territory, they aren't likely to go anywhere, and given that Ukraine would almost certainly oppose an evacuation of those troops on direct flights over Ukrainian territory, they now probably couldn't get back to Russia even if they wanted to. Instead, they remain as a constant threat, not just pressuring Moldova, but doing their part in a much broader Russian effort to make Moldova, Ukraine, and the entire region unpalatable for NATO. Russia's current influence in Transnistria goes far beyond just the deployment of its troops, into a realm referred to as soft power, that is, the use of economic or cultural means by one nation to influence another, rather than invading or strong-arming them into compliance. One major example here, and a somewhat unavoidable one, would be Russia's substantial monetary and resource contributions to Transnistria, and giving a lifeline that even if Transnistria is happy to accept, still has the ability to create and deepen a material dependency that simply cannot be forgotten. And the Sheriff Corporation, too, is a major avenue for Russia to exert soft power and influence over Transnistria. Viktor Gusin himself is a strong advocate of the set of beliefs known as Ruski Mir, which holds that independent nations like Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine are a part of a Russian world, where common roots with a sort of fatherly, benevolent version of Russia take precedence over ideas like independence and sovereignty. 
These ideas are echoed up and down the Transnistrian legislature, the country's military, and even the cities and towns where ordinary Transnistrians try to eke out a living. By Transnistrian regulations, the Russian flag must be flown beside the Transnistrian one in official settings. Publicly, the Transnistrian government espouses a view that sees Russia as the sole guarantor of its continued existence, standing firm against a coalition of westernizers that includes Moldova, Romania, Europe, and the United States. Fitting with that, Ukraine's efforts to maintain its sovereign and join NATO represents an effort to encircle Transnistria, cut it off from Russia, and force it to accept a more westernized way of life. Threats to remove Russia's peacekeeping force are thus threats to Transnistrian autonomy, just as attempts by Moldovans to work toward reintegration are an insidious form of long-term sabotage. Transnistrians, according to Transnistrians themselves, aren't simply a Moldovan separatist faction at all. They are an inextricably Russian place that just happens to be somewhat distant from Russia proper. With our view so firmly entrenched, economic outreach from Moldova has been largely unsuccessful. Repeating the cycle of past generations, the promise of higher wages in Moldova proper has given an out for people who might not have supported Transnistria's autonomy in general, but left behind an entire world of Transnistrians who are willing to accept lower wages or fewer opportunities in order to preserve the region's culture. As in the years immediately after Moldova declared its sovereignty, this pattern only serves to further isolate Transnistria, where political and business leaders are now even less likely to face pushback for their policies inside their own borders. And Transnistrians' willingness to accept some inconveniences in the name of their autonomy it doesn't stop there. Consider their willingness to continually trade in Transnistrian currency, entirely eliminating the ability to use digital payments or credit cards or conduct any kind of international business. And the same goes for the Transnistrian passport, which to most people around the world wouldn't be worth the paper it's printed on, but which in Transnistria is a valuable symbol of loyalty to a state that almost nobody else recognizes. As a result of this loyalty, Transnistria, as well as the Sheriff Corporation, have come along willingly on Russia's efforts to first infringe upon and then invade their mutual neighbor nation of Ukraine. One of Sheriff's subsidiaries, a telecommunications company called Interdenestrom, was among the very first to offer service to the Isthmus of Crimea after Russia seized and annexed it in 2014. And other Sheriff's subsidiaries sent textiles, construction equipment, and even luxury food items from Crimea across Europe and even as far as the US. Transnistria also gave Russia a valuable media victory in those first few months of annexation, publicly declaring their own wish to be annexed by Russia and generally trying to make the whole thing seem like a happy moment for Crimea rather than a violation of the international order. And once the Russian invasion of Ukraine began in earnest in March of 2022, Transnistria quickly became wrapped up in the violence. Starting in April of that year, no fewer than eight attacks occurred in Transnistria, including a drone attack, instances of Molotov cocktails being thrown at government buildings, and the laying of anti-tank mines that were used to destroy radio antennas. As for who committed those attacks, most of the international community suspects that they were a false flag attack by Russia, hoping to draw Transnistria closer to Russian hegemony, stir up violent sentiment towards Ukraine, and if Russia had rolled through Ukraine as it had planned, perhaps to use Transnistria as a staging area for an offensive that could have squashed Moldova as well. Russia, of course, claims that the attack was Ukrainian in origin, but the fact that it targeted relatively inconsequential symbolic targets would suggest that it did not come from Ukraine. Put simply, Ukraine is a lot better at sabotage than that. But if the attack was a false flag, it turns out that it may have had a somewhat opposite effect from what Russia intended. In the aftermath, Transnistria's president didn't call for violence against Ukraine or Moldova, or even accuse them directly of having perpetrated the attack. Instead, even in interviews with Russian state media, the president declined to name the group behind the attack and instead stressed that the attack failed to raise tensions between Transnistria and anybody else. It was a good series of statements for someone in his position, statements that a Russian media organization could have contextualized into a verbal blow against Ukraine, but one where the real subtext seems to be, we here in Transnistria would rather not be played. Aside from being caught in the crosshairs of one of the most unapologetically expansionist regimes out there, the war in Ukraine has given Transnistria another problem. Cut-offs from Russian oil, which until 2022, Transnistria converted into electricity and sold to Moldova. These electricity sales were no small thing for the people on either side of the Dnieper. Up to 70% of Moldovan electricity comes from Transnistria, while Transnistria reaps the financial rewards of these sales. But since then, Russia has slashed gas supply to Transnistria, forcing Transnistria to stop selling to Moldova proper. 
But this, like so many elements of a Russian conduct around its invasion of Ukraine, has ended up backfiring. Transnistria's oil shortage forced a closer collaboration between Tiraspol and Chisinau, where Moldova now buys gas from the European Union, sends the EU and Russian gas they've got to Transnistria, and receives it back in the form of electricity. At the same time, Moldova has taken steps to criminalize acts of separatism in Transnistria, not to retroactively punish people already living in the breakaway region, but to get ahead of future separatist acts that might drive Moldova and Transnistria further apart. As for who that affects? Well, in theory, the ordinary people of Transnistria should be largely immune, while the region's leaders, official and unofficial, are direct targets. The exact effects of this new law are still unknown, but at least in theory, it may be used as a tool to separate the Transnistrian population from their ruling elites. This in advance of new Moldovan movement towards European Union membership, something that would need to be explained to a Transnistrian public who've spent decades under the assumption that the EU and NATO are a destructive force. And finally, there's the implications of the war for those Russian troops still stationed in Transnistria. Although they haven't left, and in fact they're hemmed in by tanks and soldiers on the Ukrainian side of the border, they're subject to the same changing judgments of the Russian military that, well, the entire Russian military is. With Russia's global capacity to intimidate and menace the rest of the world now looking somewhat diminished, it's an open question as to whether a relatively small force of 1,500 troops will be as much as a deterrent for Moldovan pro-Europe action as they've previously been. Not only that, but if Transnistria ever does seem to grow closer to rejoining Moldova, those 1,500 troops wouldn't just have to contend with Moldovan opposition, but now Ukrainian troops as well. Ask Russia what they think about all of this, and the answer will most likely be some form of desperate times call for desperate measures. Early in 2023, documents from Russia's internal security service, the FSB, came to light, in which the FSB laid out a detailed 10-year plan to destabilize Moldova and prevent it from growing closer to Europe. The document, which seemed to be written in 2021, was focused on increasing Moldovan dependency to Russian gas and blocking Moldova's attempts to grow their influence in Transnistria. But these goals were laid out before the war in Ukraine, before Russia unintentionally forced Moldova and Transnistria to work together to keep the lights on, and before the Russian bear opened its mouth and revealed its Itself to lack any teeth. The Russian response to the report was predictable. In the words of Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, quote, We are very sorry that the current leadership of Moldova is experiencing completely unjustified and unfounded prejudices against Moscow. End quote. Now, that quote, of course, being given a little over a year into an ongoing invasion of Moldova's neighbor. After the report was revealed to the public, the EU and the United States began taking more overt steps in support of Moldova, including more energy assistance. And members of Moldova's opposition Shore Party, a group widely seen as a Russian proxy, have recently been arrested on suspicion that they intended to cause violence and unrest during peaceful protests. And the reasons why all these changes in the rest of Moldova are so important is because the country may be working toward a Transnistrian endgame, one in which the region has little choice but to come back into the fold. If and when Moldova breaks its dependency on Russian energy completely, it will then have a second choice, whether or not to also end its dependency on Transnistrian electricity. If it does, meaning that Moldova would not send its gas to Transnistria for conversion to electricity, then Transnistria will be out in the cold. Its routes to smuggle supplies through Ukraine no longer exist. Its economic dependence on Moscow is no longer tenable. And it would, almost certainly, begin the long march toward bankruptcy. If that happens, then Transnistria may have no choice but to deliver itself to Moldova on a silver platter. The alternative is that Moldova may choose to continue converting gas to electricity in Transnistria, but this time by supplying gas sourced from the EU, the United States, and other friendly partners around the world. Do this, and Transnistria gets to stay afloat, but only because of what would essentially be an unbreakable symbiosis with the rest of Moldova. That economic dependence, Moldova hopes, might lead to a range of other benefits, a decline in power for the share of corporation, an opportunity to give Moldova more leverage in Transnistrian politics, and maybe, just maybe, a real chance at reconciliation. And with Russia gone, and its weird corporate overlords unable to make ends meet for long, this may be the best option left for Transnistria. If they try to go it alone, their future is far from bright. The region suffers from severe brain drain, a situation in which young, educated Transnistrians are enticed away to other countries on the promise of wages that their Transnistrian employers simply can't match. Its ability to produce essential resources by itself is negligible in many critical sectors, and put simply, it's too small. With borders too porous, and with a government too weak 
to self-isolate in the way that, say, North Korea has. In fact, while the number of inhabitants that we gave at the start, 450,000, is generally seen as being somewhat reliable, some estimates place the real number of Transnistrians as low as 250,000, just half of what it was in the final days of the Soviet Union. Transnistria, as we speak, is falling apart, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Moldova's energy independence, and the departure of Transnistria's youth might be enough to push the region toward reintegration with Moldova for good. So, well, that's Transnistria, a well-kept secret nestled in Eastern Europe, a place where the world seems to almost turn on its head. But that is Transnistria, it's a small, struggling, breakaway region that might be on its last legs. What the future holds for the Transnistrian people, what it holds for the long legacy of pro-Russian loyalty among the population, and what reintegration with Moldova and then the West would mean, it's hard to say. But no matter how this all plays out, it seems abundantly clear that the status quo in Transnistria cannot remain stable for very long.